Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, it's uh, good to have you. Maybe it's afternoon when you're seeing this, or maybe this evening, or maybe another day, but I'm recording it this morning. So it's good to see everybody here. Hey, we are uh, closing down on the last chapters of Leviticus. We're going to be doing chapter 26 and 27 today, and then numbers 1, 2, and 3. So we have made good progress. We're uh, now, uh, today's reading, we'll actually be going into the fourth chapter of the Bible. And so this is just really awesome. We're at the beginning of February. We've done, uh, by the end of the day, accomplished three chapters of the Bible. And so I'm proud of you guys. And I just want to encourage you to continue on. Today is day, I believe, 24, I believe it is, day 24. And so we haven't quite yet been uh, 30 complete days, but we're making very good progress. And again, just thank you for being a part of this. And I just want to encourage you to continue on throughout the year, read through the Bible as we do these five chapters per day with each weekend off. And so if you have your Bible, I hope you'll open it this today. And let's have a quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for all of your many blessings. Thank you for the word, for the power of the word, for the ability to be able to hear it, read it, understand it. And Lord, we need the Holy Spirit to be able to accomplish that. So we ask that you would send him, the teacher and author of scripture, to our help. Help us to have that understanding, make that application of, of it today to ourselves. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, chapter 26 is a, uh, is a tremendous chapter. Again, we're dealing with the nation of Israel who are under covenant with God in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, of course, under the law. And God is uh, kind of summing up the statements, the laws, the the mandates that he's given them uh, for the nation, for the priesthood, for all the things that have been given up to this point. Remember, they are, uh, through the book of Leviticus, they are camped at the base of Mount Sinai, which Moses has been given the law. You may think of these things as the Ten Commandments, uh, the tablets that were written on stone by the hand of God. Now, so during this time of camping down at Mount Sinai, Moses has been given instruction by God They've already built the tabernacle, uh, given those instructions by God. God's given them, excuse me, Moses has given them to God. Moses then has given it to the people. Tabernacle has been uh, built. They've uh, already installed the priesthood. They've installed the, uh, the sacrificial system. And so as a way of, of closing these things up, much like they would do in that ancient time of, uh, of sealing up a, a covenant, uh, where the instructions and the details of that covenant are kind of the, we might would say the, the meat of the document, you know, the the real, uh, you know, the, the real content of the document, and then the closing of that document now would detail, okay, this is what's going to happen if you keep it. This is what's going to happen if you fail to keep it, and so you know it's kind of like a contract that we would have, you know, similarly similarly today, uh, but of course much more important. Uh, you know, there are, when we make a contract, if we're buying, say, a car or, or a house or something like that, piece of land, uh, you know, there are stipulations in there that if we default on, say, the payment, you know, in a certain amount of time, there's a grace period, and after that, you know, it would go back to uh, the one that holds the lien, you know, the property would or the car would, or we default on that. And then, you know, stipulations for if you want to take it to court and all those kind of things. You know, we, we're aware of those things, you know, the fine print, we might would say. Well, after all of these laws and mandates, commandments have been given, now as we're closing that section, there is the, the stipulations now of the contract, if you will, of the covenant that God has cut with Israel. And Israel has agreed to be in covenant with God. And so we're going to see the first part of this chapter deal with the blessings for their obedience and what God has instructed them to do as a nation, being obedient to him. And then after that, the curses that would result if they are disobedient or non-obedient to these uh, covenant clauses, these covenant commandments, these covenant uh, laws that have been given to them. And so we may be more familiar with the Deuteronomy 28 version of these things where this is expanded upon and Deuteronomy 28 is usually called the chapter of blessings and curses 
Now, in Deuteronomy 28, they would pronounce those things over themselves before they went into the land. Deuteronomy 28, the word Deuteronomy means, simply means a repeating of the law. And so at Deuteronomy, they're 40 years after this, and they're about to enter into the land. And so they are pronouncing those blessings and curses upon themselves. In other words, we'll be blessed if we do these things. We'll be cursed if we don't do these things. And then we had, of course, two mountains that were in view there. And so it was a different scenario, but much, much later. And so uh, Leviticus 26 is what we're going to be reading today. We're going to be seeing some of the same things that are going to be mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 28. So just giving you a preview of that. Now, what I want to do, because this is a, a lot of material, uh, when we, especially when we get to the curses, you know, it's very uncomfortable. It's not a pleasant thing to read about. And then I want to, what I want to do is, is to kind of give a summary of these things um, as we go through each one of the blessings or the curses. And so hopefully that will help make, uh, make these things a little bit more understandable because we're reading in these big blocks. Sometimes it's easy to, to miss the specificity of it, the specifics of it. And so uh, that's the way I want to kind of cover this today. So if you will, look at it with me, chapter 26, verses 1 through 13. These are going to be the blessings of obedience. You shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last from the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full, dwell in your land safely. I will give you peace in the land, or I will give peace in the land, rather, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Now that is a ratio of about uh, the first one. Five of you should chase a uh, hundred is a ratio of one to twenty. And a hundred of you shall put a 10,000 to flight is a ratio of one to a hundred. So that's a tremendous advantage that the Lord is giving them. Okay. For I, your enemies shall fall by the sword before you, for I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you. Now, this is a real blessing. The material things that have been coming before this were a blessing in themselves, but the real blessing, and, and hear this in this way, that without this blessing that we're about to read, the other would just be uh, really of no avail. You know, they, they would still never be satisfied. They would never be fulfilled. They would never be really blessed without this part here. This is the most important part. I will set my tabernacle among you. And my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God. And you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you upright. So you can see the tremendous blessing that is. To have God dwelling in their midst. Having his house, his tabernacle there. His dwelling place in the midst of them. Going to walk with them. And, uh, and not... Depart from them. This is an amazing, amazing blessing uh, statement here in these verses here. Now, uh, let me kind of give you a little summary of these things. If you're one to, to take notes or if you want to jot some of these things down or just maybe circle these verses. Uh, in verses 4 and 5, God is promising to give them plenty. In verse 6, he's promising to give them peace. In verse 6, also giving them protection. In verse 7 and 8. He's giving them power. In verse 9, giving them prosperity. In verse 10, giving them provision. And verse 11 and 12, like we just spoke of, giving them his presence. 
And so think about all these things. Plenty, peace, protection, power, prosperity, provision, presence, the presence of God. You know, these are the things that people seek today. Now, these are the things that really people go after, all these things. And these are tremendous blessings. So can you imagine what it would be like to hear that all of these things that we've just read and then we've, we've kind of summarized by uh, a single word, how blessed these people are in receiving these blessings just by simply being obedient to God, the God in which they had been in covenant with, uh, entered into covenant with, I should say, the one that had rescued them out of the land of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery, and then placed his promises among them and his dwelling place among them. Wow, what a blessed people. Okay, now what we're going to do is move now to the section now that is speaking about the curses that will befall them if they are disobedient. So in inverse of the blessing, of course, would be the curses. And it's hinging upon their obedience to the laws, mandates, the commandments that they had been given by God. Now, obviously, they want to be blessed. And God has given them, of course, the, the kind of the good news first. This is a good news, good news and bad news. The good news is you're going to be blessed if you just simply be obedient to the law that I've given you. And now comes the bad news. If they're going to disobey God's commandments, God's decrees, God's laws, God's mandates, then curses are going to fall because of that. And he lists them for them. All right, so these are, are of course, you know, we've had 13 verses of, of blessings. And then there's going to be triple that for the curses. Starting with verse 14. This is a long section, so, so bear with me and stay with me if you will. But if you will not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your souls abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, Again, the emphasis on them breaking the covenant. God is not going to break the covenant. They would be breaking it with God. Break my covenant. I also will do this to you. And here comes the really bad news. So, so kind of fasten your seatbelts for this section here. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. You shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you. Wow, that's a, that's a tremendous thing that you never want to hear. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. Wow. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Now, what, what I want you to see here, let me pause just a second, is that it, the the Initial disobedience brings about a curse, and then it's in stages, if you will, giving them a, a time to see, okay, this is not going too well for us. Maybe we should turn back, and, and of course they should turn back, but maybe they're making that decision for themselves. We need to turn back to God. But if they choose to remain in their disobedience, then God intensifies the curses. So understand that, that he's not wanting to just unload his wrath upon, wrath upon them, He's wanting them to turn back to him, wanting him, them to, to see their error, turn back to obedience, and if they will, then the blessings will start to flow again. But if they choose not to be obedient, if they choose to be disobedient, then the curses intensify. Okay? So, where were we? Uh, after this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sin. So it increases by a fold or intensity of seven. Seven, of course, is number of completion or perfection in that sense. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, here we go, we're intensifying it even more. I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. 
And if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, then I'll also walk contrary to you. And I'll punish you yet seven times for your sin. So again, this intensity is continuing to increase because of their disobedience. And I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. Wow. Now, that is a, a tremendous speaking of, a tremendous statement speaking of the scarcity and the lack there in famine. It's going to be, uh, it's going to, you're going to have ten times less bread. Uh, where one person would bake the bread, it's going to be ten people now breaking the same amount of, baking the same amount of bread, and bread is going to be so scarce, it's going to be sold by weight. Now, of course, in the ultimate, they, they saw this initially as a nation. Ultimately, we see this going to be fulfilled in the, the writing of the four horsemen in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 6, when we see those four horses ride, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. And the black horse, of course, and the pale horse both speak about a time of, of scarcity and disease, famine, and following pestilence of that. And a time where we're going to see the, the bread actually uh, measured out in a way that, you know, that we don't see that today. You know, we buy a loaf of bread, we don't buy it by weight. But scarcity is going to be so intense in those times that it's going to be sold by, by weight, which is speaking about extreme, extreme scarcity. Okay. Coming back to this, it says, uh, I'll cut off your supply of bread. Ten women shall break your bread, one oven. And after this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons and shall eat the flesh of your daughters. Now this is a, uh, let's pause right here. This is something that actually took place in the book of Kings, Second Kings, I believe it is. Um, where the king was walking and some uh, a woman called out to him and asked for his help and, and what well what can I help you what, what ails you is the wording that he used and the woman told about the agreement that she had with another woman where they actually if you can believe this or not uh, but yet it's, it's true it's hard to believe they actually uh, agreed to eat their children and a woman was complaining that we we entered an agreement that we would we would boil my son today and eat her son tomorrow. Now that's a very sickening thought. And she's complaining because they went ahead and carried it through and they boiled her son. And then the next day come when it was time to do that terrible thing uh, of of killing her the other person's son and eating him, that the mother hid her son. So the first one, they sacrificed that son and, and engaged in cannibalism because they didn't have anything to eat. And then she was deceived, of course, as you can imagine. And the mother of the other son hid that son. And now she's wanting the king to, to uh, decree or to issue some form of judgment to make those things right. That's how bad it had gotten in Israel in that day. What a sad, sad time. And of course... Uh, you may have heard of the Rome, excuse me, Jewish historian. Uh, he would be mad if he heard me call him Roman. The Jewish historian Josephus, that lived uh, during the time of Christ, wrote about that during the siege of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. that they were actually doing those same things as well. They had engaged in extreme forms of cannibalism because of the lack of food. The Romans had lead, laid siege to Jerusalem for over a year, and that's how tragic that it had gotten. And yet God is, is calling these things out uh, here around, you know, or roughly, say, 1,400, 1,500 years before these things would take place in, in the event of 70 A.D. Of course, in the time of the kings, that would have been uh, you know, hundreds of years later, not a thousand. Okay, and so, but yet God is warning them that this is what's going to happen. And we, we see that these things did eventually happen because they were disobedient. Sad, sad, sad commentary on the nation of Israel. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms 
of your idol, speaking about their idol worship that they would be doing, their high places and their incense off, not, not for God, but for the false idols that they would worship, Baal and Ashtaroth and, and Moloch and all those others that they had engaged in, the Canaanite gods that they had, they had come in to worship. And my soul shall abhor you, and I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation. And I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas, meaning when they offer their incense to the Lord, but he's not going to accept it. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell on it shall be astonished at you, or at it, excuse me. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. And that certainly happened. The land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate, and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbath. Now, the chapter prior to this, as you were reading, you saw that where the land was to be given a Sabbath. Yeah, you heard right. The land in Israel was to be given a Sabbath year. They were to till the land. They were to plant in the land. Uh, and they were to harvest the land for six years. But the seventh year, the land was to lie fallow. It was not to be tilled or, or, or planted or, or harvested. That was a Sabbath for the land, the seventh year. And God had instructed him to do that. He would provide double, actually triple in the sixth year, so that whenever the seventh year come, they were able to do exactly what God had instructed them to do. And then the next year, where they were waiting for the, the as they were planting, waiting for the harvest, you know, they still had to carry over from the sixth year. So hopefully that makes sense to you. The They did not... Uh, apply that law, the law of the Sabbath. And what we learned from the, the book of Chronicles was that God had said that for 490 years you did not observe the Sabbath of the land. And so when you break that down, divide that by seven, that comes into 70 years. And so guess how many years Israel spent in captivity because they did not obey the law of the Sabbath? Yes, right. 70 years. God said, for 490 years, you disobeyed me, so you owe me 70, and so you won't allow the land to, to enjoy its Sabbath, so you're going to be carried off into Babylon. And the land will enjoy its, its Sabbath, 70 years, and that's exactly how long the captivity was. So God means what he says, and he says what he means. And so it's exactly what took place. Judah, uh, the, the kingdom of Judah, was taken into Babylon captivity and returned 70 years later. It's amazing how these things took place in the exact way that God said that they would. Okay. All right, so I will send faintness into the hearts. As for those of you who are left, I will send faintness into the hearts of the land of their enemies. The sound of a shaken leaf shall cause them to flee. Wow. They shall flee as though fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when no one pursues. They're going to be of such a, a timid type of a... a um, attitude and so scared living in fear that you know just the wind you know or a small animal wrestling the leaves and cause them to to run like somebody's trying to attack them but there's no one there they shall stumble over one another as it were before a sword when no one pursues and you shall have no power to stand before your enemies wow you shall perish among the nations and the land of your enemies shall eat you up and those of you who are left shall waste away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. Also in their father's iniquity, which are with them, they shall waste away. Okay, so a lot of tremendous things. Now, some of the, uh, the scripture reference for that in Kings is 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, verses 26 through 29. Okay, now let me kind of give you some... Uh, summary statements like we did about the blessings okay so if you're again taking notes if you want to jot some of these things down or just circle them he's the results of their disobedience verse 16 pestilence verse 16 as well they would sow in vain the enemies would reap it verse 17 they'd be slain before their enemies all these things are you know in opposition to what the blessings were in verse 19 and 20, they would have crop failure. In verse 22, they'd have a plague of wild beasts. The wild beasts, you know, would come to the land and take many of their young children away. Uh, verse 25, they would be stricken with a sword. 
course, the enemy's sword and with pestilence. Uh, verse 26, they'd have a lot of frustration because they would eat and not be satisfied. Verses 29, 30, and 31 speak about that horror and desolation that we, we described there in, in 2 Kings chapter 6. And also 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 9 and 10 is a good reference to that. Verse 33, they would be dispersed throughout the world. And certainly that took place after 70 AD. It wasn't until 1948, whenever Israel was able to uh, rename their city, their land in which they were given, um, uh, Israel, the nation, I should say, not the city, the nation. 1948, from 70 AD until 1948, uh, Israel basically was a dispersed people. A wandering Jew is uh, a term that was referring to them. And in verse 44, uh, they would be preserved as a people. Now, next we're going to see the blessings of the repentance. If they would come back to God, you know, we saw the blessings if they were obedient. We saw the curses if they were disobedient. Now, of course, God is not wanting them to be cursed. He's wanting them to turn back. So now, listen to what he's saying now about their repentance. If they'll turn back, uh, these things will happen. Verses 40 through 46. But if they confess their enemy, there's a big word there, but, and it's not in the original, but we, it's inferred, but it is in our translations. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, and that they also have walked contrary to me, and that I have walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are humble and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. And I will remember, I will remember the land. The land also shall be left empty by them and will enjoy its Sabbath while it lies desolate with them. They will accept their guilt because they despise my judgments and because their soul abhor my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, speaking about Babylon, I will not cast them away. God's not going to forsake them. They are being uh, punished because of their disobedience. But God's not, he's not through with Israel. Wasn't through with them then. He's not through with them now. He hasn't forsook the covenant with them. They are being, in a way, chastised, disciplined. But yet, God has not forgotten them. He's not forsaken them. He says, I will not cast them away nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and to break my covenant with them. See, God's not going to break his covenant with Israel. For I am the Lord, their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments of laws which the Lord has made between himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. And so we see God's mercy in view here. That if they will acknowledge their offense, if they will acknowledge, you know, their uh, their wrong, we see the greatness of God's mercy. He's going to remember these things. God will always remember, always receive, and bless a repentant Israel. And so it's just up to them, you know, which way do they want it? God gives them the both sides of the coin, we might would say. Okay, if you want blessings, this is what you need to do. And if you don't want those blessings because you're wanting to be disobedient, then these things will happen, these curses. And so the choice is up to them. God offers them both. One hand is the blessings, the other hand is the curses. Which one do they? would you choose? Well, we, we all want to be blessed, I think. Uh, I know I do. Well, the, the obedience there he offers Israel uh, for the blessings. Be obedient, you'll get the blessings. But if you be disobe disobedient, the curses will result. And so it's up to them. But if they fall into those areas of the curses, God says, if you'll repent, then I'll show you mercy. Thank the Lord. The Lord is merciful. You know, God, uh, to you and me who are under the new covenant, we're not up under the old covenant, of course. We're under the new covenant. Jesus said whenever he took that cup there, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, making a new covenant with them. And Jesus, of course, is a sacrifice that is perfect, pure, without fault, without any kind of blemish. He's a complete sacrifice, one for all, as the book of Hebrews speaks about. 
And we're up under a new covenant. But you know, as Christians under the new covenant, God is always going to be faithful to his covenant. The covenant that he made with you and me. And you know, as we looked at it last time, I'll again repeat it to you. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it says, If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just. He will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God is faithful. Faithful to who? Faithful to his covenant. Faithful to you and me. And whenever the Lord looks at you and I as believers today, what he sees, he sees the shed blood of Calvary's cross. He sees his son who was that sacrifice, who died in our stead, in our place. And that blood is sufficient for all of the removal, all the cleansing, all the forgiveness of our sins. Whenever we fall into wrong like Israel did, you know, we have the opportunity and the choice to fall upon God for his mercy and his grace, for his forgiveness. And it's just simply dependent upon us. For Israel, what did they have to do? They had to acknowledge what they had done, and they had to come back to God, turn back to him. For you and I, we confess. Remember from yesterday, we said that confessing is saying the same thing as God says. God says something is sin. We have to come over to his side. He's not going to come over to ours, but he come, we come over to his and agree with God. And if we'll do that, God will show his faithfulness to his covenant that he has made to us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful that we're under the new covenant and not up under the old covenant like we read about today. And I hope that you have... Uh, have been able to glean some some of the blessings out of this today, not only for uh, for ourselves today, but also for the information of what we'll see as we go forward in the scriptures and seeing what would befall Israel. Hopefully, this will stick out into your mind if we continue to go through the Bible and we'll see their obedience and how that'll play. But we'll also see when disobedience comes, what results is that, and hopefully, this will be a reminder for you that, hey, I remember reading that way back in Leviticus, that they, they put themselves in this way, in covenant with God, and, and whenever they were disobedient by raising up idols or, or doing all these other things, be, breaking the law of God, that disobedience was going to bring about a curse, and sure enough, it did. And we'll be able to see God was certainly faithful. And Israel, because of their unfaithfulness to God, brought this upon themselves. And so we have a, a tremendous uh, respect for the Word of God, a, a, a blessing for being able to remember those things that God has, has shown us in His Word, and it also should have a way of application for our lives even today. Amen. Well, it's so good to have you guys again join me, and I hope you'll continue to read today. Remember, 26 and 27, we'll wrap up Leviticus, and so you'll be in Numbers uh, 1, 2, and 3. Numbers 1, 2, and 3. Lord willing, I'll be back with you tomorrow, and we'll be covering chapter 4 of the book of Numbers. I'll try to give a, a, a summary introduction to that book as well. And again, thank you for your time. Hope you have a blessed day, and I hope to see you tomorrow. God bless.